These people protesting are all gold-collar workers in China, but now they are in crisis too. There are people sitting around on the stairs in front of the bank building. Photos show employees of Pudong Development Bank not working after clocking in and posting paper signs with the characters "strike" on their cubicles at work. Today, when I was working at the office, I saw various websites saying that a well-known bank, their employees were rallying. I went to check it out after finishing work. It's probably the end of the day by this time. Many people are no longer here. Some are asked or persuaded to leave. On site, there were a lot of police and buses taking people away. Maybe the economic situation in the past few years has made people panic, and many places have cut employees' salaries or something. I remember a news article I read. It said the volume of delivery and rideshare DD drivers has been increasing nowadays. What does that tell you? It means many people are staying home but can't find work. What can we do? The financial circle has become impossible to stay in. These two days, a beautiful lady named Leo of the Equity Investment Department of the financial subsidiary of Pudong Development Bank signed on the internal communication app that my salary has been lowered to 6,260.9 yuan. Monthly salary is too low, far below my value. I am on strike. Please pardon me. If you need to see me, please wait a moment because I am on strike. Clearly visible here is the Pudong Bank Financial Management Division of Equity Investment. A photo was posted in her cubicle. Sure enough, no one was at the desk. The wall was covered with signs that said "strike." I am attentive and find that the next cubicle behind it was also covered with signs of "strike." So, what is the background of this lady? She is really prolific, with a Zhejiang University's undergraduate degree in finance and a master's degree in finance at Tulane University Freeman School of Business. Five years to finish a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in finance. Now, after serving in the investment bank department of CICC Securities, CICC, you know, CICC's investment banking was once the starry sky that the national financial circle looked up to. Ah,、uh, now she jumps ship to do equity investment in Pudong Development Finance. Here, ah,、uh, I'm a little puzzled. A bank's financial advisor, it's fine to sell mutual funds. Why would someone want to engage in an equity investment with such a long investment cycle and such poor liquidity? It seems unnecessary. And now, look at the financial circle. It's like wearing a single shirt through the winter. The economy has no momentum. The stock market has no vitality. Deposits are increasing. No one is buying financial products. The whole industry is depressed, and everyone needs a psychologist. This Luo manager, a tough and proud lady, is like a rainbow under the gray depressed sky. Let's share the video quickly. No comparison, no harm. It turns out we are all in the same misery. Subsequently, Pudong Development Bank confirmed the authenticity of the incidents. In one case, employees of a subsidiary announced a strike over pay. In the other, the outdoor protest was pictured as a labor dispute between a business outsourcing company and its employees. A social media outlet of an overseas Chinese cited informed sources as saying, "There are many such fund management companies in Shanghai. They are similar to state-owned enterprises in second and third-tier cities in mainland China, and the turnover of staff in the industry is still relatively high. Be it security firms, mutual funds, banks, or insurance companies." They are basically jumping from one to another, and the average salary of a salesperson with three to five years of experience is 200,000 RMB per year, or about 29,000 USD, which is already considered a low salary. Now the pay is reduced to US 860 a month, which is equivalent to breaking a bone for these people. The source also said that the employee whose cubicle was plastered with strike signs is now going through the resignation process. As for those protesters in front of the building, they belong to the outsourcing team of the Pudong Bank credit card branch. The protest rally is because the outsourcing team is asking for a wage increase and to address the issue of their employment status. But their negotiation with the credit card branch failed. Pudong Development Bank is a state-owned financial enterprise headquartered in Shanghai. The banker in the UK and authoritative international financial media released a list of the top 1,000 global banks in 2022.
Pudong Development Bank ranked 18th with Tier 1 capital of over US $103 billion and was ranked among the top 20 global banks for the third consecutive year. But it slipped to 27th place by February 2023. Regardless, Pudong Development Bank is still a strong player. In China, the banking industry was once perceived as a high-paying industry with golden rice bowls, and it was probably the most popular profession except for civil servants. Those who work in the financial industry can be considered gold-collar. Their monthly salary, which used to range from 3,000 to 4,300 US dollars, has suddenly dropped to more than 860 US dollars. It means that those in the financial industry whose standard of living has always been relatively high are going to face great adjustments. According to a Chinese research think tank, Ji Yan Consulting, in 2020 there were more than 126,000 employees in the banking industry in Shanghai. Imagine, the vast majority of these gold-collar workers have undoubtedly bought a flat in Shanghai and need to make mortgage payments. How can they afford it when they used to make at least US 3000 a month, but now they suddenly have to live with only US 800 or so a month? These people, who used to have the highest coefficient of financial security among Chinese families, are now having trouble making ends meet. In China, property has already become a financial commodity, especially in big cities. Once a property becomes a financial commodity, its price fluctuations are highly influenced by social sentiment, rather than by supply and demand. Social sentiment can cause the price of financial products to rise or fall steeply. The news that even long-term bank employees can't afford to pay off their mortgages should be a more significant stimulus to the market than the number of homes in stock. In other words, if banks weren't in major distress, they wouldn't have to cut the salaries of senior employees in such a dramatic fashion, as the consequences would be severe. Whether it's the general pay cut for Pudong Development Bank's employees or outsourcing its operations, which was behind the protest over falling pay, they are both signs of the downturn in China's banking industry. Yet, if one examines official data from the Chinese government, one won't notice anything unusual happening in this red state. China News Service reported on May 10th that China's National Bureau of Statistics released the average wage data for the year 2022 on May 9th, 2023. The data shows that China's finance industry has the highest average wage growth rate. Among urban non-private units, the average annual wage in the finance sector reached over 174,000 yuan, or about US 25,000, an increase of 15.6%. In the private sector, the average annual wage reached over 110,000 yuan, or about US 16,000, also an increase of 15.6%. This is quite different from the data coming from the financial industry itself. Sina.com reported on May 6 that as of May 4, the Oriental Fortune Choice Financial Terminal had compiled salary data of 52 brokerage firms in China including A-share listed firms, NSS listed brokerage firms, and proposed brokerage firms that have released their prospectus filings. According to the statistics, 48 of the 52 Chinese brokerage firms mentioned have seen a decline in the per capita compensation of their employees. The one with the largest decline saw a 45.14% decline in per capita salary. There are 22 brokerages with per capita salary decreases of more than 20%, and 15 brokerages with decreases between 10 and 20%. In other words, as many as 37 brokerage firms have seen their per capita pay drop by more than 10%, accounting for the majority. According to our experience, data from the Chinese industry is usually retouched, although nowhere near how it is modified in the official version. China's banks are in trouble. In addition to employees' pay cuts, benefit reductions, and layoffs, in the recent two years, we have seen depositors in many parts of China struggle to access their funds and withdraw their money. In May, one of the more significant incidents was the suspension of a massive amount of bank cards from the Yunnan Construction Bank in the southwestern part of China. Several bank cards have been suspended today. This time, so many have had their bank cards suspended. Do you 
Look how many people are wasting time because their Yunnan construction bank cards are suspended. Ha ha ha. Oops, what's wrong with the agricultural bank? All of the people are lining up here to unfreeze their bank cards. You've suspended my bank card a few times already. What are you doing? Have I broken the law? You tell me. You list them out in one, two, three, four. How have I broken the law? You suspend my card. Customers with large amounts of savings need to be extra careful. This depositor has nearly 3 million or US 430,000 that he can't withdraw after his father passed away. After the funeral, I went to the bank. It's about 700,000 to 800,000 yuan. According to the bank regulations, I have to provide notarization. But except for the first one, where I have to provide my personal ID card, the deceased ID card and death certificate, except for these ones, I can get the notarization for them. For the rest of the notifications, I can't get any of them. One transaction is a large deposit, about 1.15 million yuan, in a mutual fund. How much is it? About 278,000 yuan. This man is unable to withdraw the assets left by his father. And this woman is experiencing difficulties in withdrawing her mother's savings. The professional level is so bad. Even this can't prove she's my mother, that I still need to go to the neighborhood committee to prove that she's my mother. This customer tried to withdraw 300,000 yuan or about US 44,000 from Agricultural Bank and was given a hard time. Can I get 300,000 tomorrow if I make an appointment today? Today? Yes, make an appointment today. Can I get 300,000 tomorrow? It's such a big bank. Oh, appointments have to be made before 3 p.m. I said I'll make an appointment now. Can I get 300,000 tomorrow? I can only give you an appointment tomorrow. After that, on Monday, we can. How come I can't make an appointment today? It needs to be done by 3.30 p.m. How come I can't make an appointment today? We just need to set a time. Please don't film. Why is it okay to deposit money, but it takes days and days to take out money when I need it? How come I can't make an appointment today? I need it at 3.30 p.m. How come I can't make an appointment today? Oh, um, just need to set a time. Please don't film. Why is it okay to save money, but it takes days and days to take it out when I need it urgently? According to media reports in China, major banks have started to impose transaction limits on their customers starting in 2022. Among them, there are already a number of banks, including Agricultural Bank, Pudong Development Bank, Fuzhou Branch, Chengdu Branch, Changsha Branch, and Hongzhou Branch, and Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, Fujian Branch, which have a daily transaction limit of about 5,000 yuan per day, or about US 780. Some of them have even reduced it to US 150 per day. Bank of China customer service told the media that this is to prevent telecom fraud and the bank has adjusted the non-counter transaction limits for Type 1 and Type 2 bank cards. However, the media subsequently found out that a much wider range of customers has in fact been subject to the limit, and it's not only limited to users holding Type 1 and Type 2 bank cards. The strangest thing is that these banks don't inform their customers in advance and don't explain the reason why they set the limit. Some of them simply suspend their customers' bank cards, all of this makes the public distrust the official explanation of so-called protection against the risk of telecom fraud. After seeing this news, I was like, you're kidding us. If there were a competition to tell lies, no one would be better than your banks. We the people work so hard every day. Is it easy for us to make money? We work very hard to earn little money and deposit it with you. That's what you do, trying all kinds of fancy tricks against us. Before the money is deposited, look at your staff, addressing us as big brother and big sister warmly. When you see those who are senior in age, you rush to assist them, especially when the money is about to be deposited. The process is convenient and fast. That time your service is absolutely fabulous, no complaint whatsoever, and it's impossible to pick a fault. However, when it comes to withdrawing money, look, your faces are cold, as if we all owe you a lot of money. This process of taking out money is so difficult. 
First, there are all kinds of excuses to make things difficult, and then we are asked to provide a variety of documents. Then we wait helplessly until the flowers wither, and then we are told the bank doesn't have so much cash, and we have to make an appointment in advance. Isn't it outrageous? Now you ran out of tricks and came up with an excuse for preventing telecom fraud, setting a daily limit of US 780. So, I say you should just limit it to 7 cents. That will definitely prevent telecom fraud. Or even better, you should close the bank and ban the bank cards, which would not only prevent fraud, but eliminates the problem directly from its root. You guys are fussing over these all day long. If we were sick and needed to go to the hospital, we had to pay the medical fees urgently. We would need a lot of money, and what would happen to us? Do we have to wait around for your approval? When you finish your review, I guess the family would have to hold the anniversary ceremony for the deceased passing away for years. In the future, when we need to buy a home, a car or jewelry, or gold or silver, we will have to go with a pile of cash. The reason we put the money in the bank is because we trust you, and like the convenience, we don't do it to add extra trouble for ourselves. This man should have seen the essence of the problem. That is, Chinese banks are running out of money. Behind the crisis in the banking industry, there is a more significant and deeper reason. That is, the Chinese economy has taken a big turn for the worse, and a deflationary spiral has emerged. A deflationary spiral is a decline in price that brings about a chain reaction and a vicious cycle. With the economy in a downturn, many Chinese companies are forcing employees to leave their jobs voluntarily by cutting their salaries so as to minimize company compensation and disputes. When the economy is in a deflationary spiral, the prospects look very bad. Companies' earnings would fall, employees would get laid off, employees' income would fall, consumer spending would fall, companies would end up making less profit, and employees would have even less money to spend. Our channel has presented various signs of China in recession, falling into a deflationary spiral. For example, a recent episode of Poor Travel was about the huge increase in people traveling on the May Golden Week holiday, but there was a decline in average spending. Restaurants and shopping streets were crowded, but with lower sales and unit prices than what they were before the 2019 epidemic. The link to this episode is posted below. Over the past 40 years, although the financial problems of the CCP have been serious, they have remained relatively stable because of the government's backing and China's sustained high economic growth. These two factors ensure that when risks occur, the government can stabilize investors' confidence and prevent a run on the market. It thus gave enough time for the government to digest the stock risk and suspend the incremental risk. But the government underwriting cannot be sustained for long. The economy is declining, which increases the financial risks. In other words, it's only a matter of time before a financial crisis breaks out, or it is simply inevitable. Regarding the signs of the financial crisis, someone on China's Jihu website cited an analysis that we think sounds reasonable. We would like to share it here. The author says the US think tank summarized the 10 signs before the outbreak of the financial crisis based on the characteristics of the global financial crisis in 1988, the Asian financial crisis in 1998, and the US financial crisis in 2008. They are 1. A stock market crash 2. Massive capital flight 3. Bank credit crisis 4. Obvious rise in corporate debt defaults 5. Serious asset price bubble 6. Massive decrease in official foreign exchange reserves 7. Serious overall economic downturn 8. High corporate or residential asset and liability ratio 9. A significant decline in corporate profits or residential income growth rate 10. Major national disaster the author also writes that experts believe that if a country meets more than three of the above ten signs, it is a sign that a financial crisis is coming soon. If a country meets more than six, it means that an economic crisis has already come. From the current situation in China, the ten signs are virtually all present. The reason why there is no full-blown outbreak is mainly that the government uses administrative intervention to suppress it. However, this suppression can only be temporary, and it'll increase the scope of the financial crisis and the damaging power once the crisis breaks out.